All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Cypher here. Um, let's make sure that I am actually live. Um, good on Twitch and whoop, good on YouTube. All right. So, um, the uh, today we're going to be we have uh, two things to cover today, um, and one of them is a is another book that <clears throat> I used pretty extensively in the most recent video, which uh, blew up quite well. <laughs> the last video got a lot of views, um, and um. Uh, but before we do that, we'll, we'll be covering, um, I, I'm going to be talking about this uh, group trip thing. But even before that, always got to start off with a beer. <laughs> so to, today I'll be drinking um, Founders. I should have thought about that, but I can't say that word right now because uh, <laughs> that's a uh, no-no word for uh, YouTube might get this demonetized um but it's from founders brewery and it's a uh it's a a uh a well it doesn't actually say but it's basically a brown ale um and it's barrel aged so it's very potent so um here we go <laughs> get that in there all right now that that's all out of the way i wanted to show you guys this uh it's this uh thing called trova trip that is running right now um and you guys can sign up for it and i want to field some uh, i want to answer some of your guys's questions uh about it. So first, let me do this. Do, do, do. Share screen. Um, there we go. All right. So, uh, Trove Trip is a uh, company that basically allows people to host their own group trips, and I will be hosting a group trip to Germany. Um, well, Germany and Austria, actually. Um, and it's uh, it'll be, as you can see there, on June 4th through June 11th in, on, in uh, 2024, so next year. <sighs> so <clears throat> essentially what this is is that uh, we'd spend about a week um, going from Munich to Salzburg to Vienna. Um, here, let me, uh, why isn't it letting me, there we go. Um, so, um, there's plenty of spots open, but there, there is a limited quantity, uh, quantity of them. And essentially for that price tag right there is the entire trip, right? The, the cost of the trip that also includes some food. So there will be. Uh, yeah, seven breakfasts and two dinners. Uh, most dinners you'll be, uh, well, we'll be on our own, um, say for at the beginning and end. But in the morning, we'd get together, go have uh, breakfast, and then we'd ha send, bleh, head out on a uh, trip uh, on to a whole bunch of different places. So if you go down here, you can see that there's all these trip activities. Um, so, you know, starts off with a cycling tour of Munich, um, which will end at a beer hall, actually. Um, then the next couple days go to, to two different castles. Then we'd uh, take a train to Salzburg, um, where we'd, uh, you know, walk around and get uh, uh, introduced to uh, Salzburg. And then the next one, the the next day we'd go to uh, 
Hohenzollern, um, the the uh, big fortress up the hill there. Um, and then the next day would actually be devoted to a bunch of stuff regarding the sound of music. Um, that's actually a based on a true story musical, and some of you may know that I'm kind of a sucker when it comes to musicals. Uh, and I actually I've been wanting to make a uh, to make a review of the sound of music for a long time. Um, you know the uh, I haven't actually yet done all the reading for that. Um, you know. Obviously, I will have a whole year to do that, so I don't actually know how accurate the movie is right now. Um, I will, of course, once once this comes around. But this would be part of making that episode. So you guys would actually be able to see me doing what's necessary to record, to get B-roll and all that kind of stuff um, while we're there. And realize that all of these tours are are while well, I'm the host, so I'm like the person who like gathers everybody up and says like we're going here and here's what to expect and all that. Each of these places will have uh, tour guides as well. So I wouldn't uh, I would be the host of the trip, not the uh, not the tour guides because frankly I want to learn about a lot of this stuff too. Um, so you know there's a there's a lot of in, a lot of cool things that we'd be doing there. Um, then after the Sound of Music uh, day, we would hop on the train to Vienna, um, do a orientation walk there, and the final day uh, ends with a tour of the uh, palace there in uh, in Vienna. Um, so a lot of history to learn about, a lot of cool things, and. Uh, it just seems like a whole heck of a lot of fun. Um, if you guys have any further questions, we can come back to this. Um, but uh, yeah, that will be that's available. The link is in the description. I already put it in the chat. So let's talk about Myth America. Um, this is what's called uh, this is what's called an edited volume um <laughs> if i was teaching a class i'd uh, ask somebody to define edited volume right now but <laughs> uh i'm not teaching class i'm live streaming uh so an edited volume means that it is composed of multiple um composed of multiple uh, uh each chapter is its own thing. Um, oh, I forgot that I have little banners to put on everything. Yay, there we go. Look at that. Isn't that fancy? Um, so, uh, the... Uh, do, do, do. There we go. As you can see here, the... Um, and is the text big enough? Does Do I need to make the text larger i'm i'm at maximum text size all right well that's um it's the best i could do then um but uh each chapter is written by a different person and uh covers a different thing that's kind of basically what an edited volume is it's a book that's composed of articles so each chapter is an article um in fact I might actually be uh, writing for an edited volume fairly soon here myself. Anyways, um, this, as the subtitle says, is historians take on the biggest legends and lies about our past. Um, you guys might recognize the authors as well. They, they've brought in a lot of famous historians um, to talk about all this stuff. Um, yeah, it's... It's uh, going to be interesting how we break it down on all this. But I also have to point out that this is on um, a uh, on a uh, Google Books, meaning um, meaning that it will 
instead of having like in d discrete pages and everything, how you cite a uh, a EPUB at, such as this is that you use that little number down there. So um, that's the uh, that's the page numbering. It doesn't have um, as good as like uh, uh, a um, PDF where it's you know just copies of the pages, uh, you know, photocopies of the pages. Um, <clears throat> instead, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, just the text and, you know, just trying to fit the screen as best as possible. So uh, keep that in mind when we're talking about this, if anybody is trying to, uh, trying to follow along, um, you know, I can only give those page num the these fractional page numbers as in out of uh, 442 um, as opposed to uh, um, the actual page number so uh, but before we jump into that um, <clears throat> I just want to catch up on the comments to make sure I haven't missed anything um <clears throat> do, 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 do. So this book is available online. Um I'm, basically everything I post is available online and in the description below you can see uh as it scrolls by, there's actually like an Amazon affiliate link right there. Uh, it'll come back around, but it also it's also in the description. Um, so you can actually just go straight to uh, Amazon, click on that, and um, you know if you want to follow along with all this, you can start following pretty much immediately. Um, yeah. So. Uh, the. Uh, they took the train. Oh, oh! You guys are still talking about the sound of music. <laughs> are, I've been, I have no idea. Um. <clears throat> anyways, the uh, the um. So, this is also a perfect time because it is the book itself is related to um my most recent video the uh 10 found uh, town bleh, 10 american founding myths um the uh um the uh wow lose my words <laughs> so I, I read this book um, actually after I had started creating that video, but something you have to understand is a lot of my videos are have been in the works for over a year. Um, no joke, I came up with the list of myths, um, geez, like over a year ago. Uh, and this book didn't come out until this year. So um, I didn't exactly base the uh, episode on this book, but once I read the book, it was like, wow, they're saying some of the same things that I uh, that I already said, and I actually modified a couple of things to uh, um, fit better with what the book says. So yeah, uh, while I didn't base the episode on this book, I did uh, use it to improve the episode. Ah. <clears throat> Will this be VOD meaning video on demand, right? Um, yeah, it will be available, uh, you know, on YouTube. Um, on Twitch, it will be available for I think two weeks. It's either one week. It's either two weeks or three weeks. I can't remember which. Um, but on uh, on. Um, <laughs> It will be available if you uh, started too late and you know missed the first chunk. I will be going back over what we 
covered in the first chunk anyways, um, just in case people missed it. Um, but uh, we're on the book now, and we're talking about the book. And <laughs> I mean, you could take the root out of the out of that. It's uh, definitely without the uh, the root part of that. Uh, it's uh, founders. Um, barrel aged. How do I generally respond to people disregarding my videos like that, or is it just not worth it? Look, if people want to, uh, if people want to deny history, that's up to them. I don't, I don't have to give them any time either. Really. You know, it's, um, generally I approach it as like, you came to me, not the other way around, you know? <laughs> Um, but, uh, of course, you know, it, there is this problem and yeah, let me show that again. There is this problem in academia that you have a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, academics are kind of dismissive of, uh, what they call pop history, but actually public history. Um, you know, unlike pop history this isn't just primarily meant for for pure money you know it's nice to have but the main thing is i'm putting out videos that i'm passionate about and uh are meant to actually advance the profession um and that relates to today's topic the the vid the uh the book um because they're the the authors of um of uh whoops there we go of myth america also are doing the same thing right you know their whole thing is that they write a chapter about some general myth and um and they uh they you know explain how the myth came about and how uh how to you know dispel it um <clears throat> uh how oh, here's a good question how old does a historical building slash artifact have to be to be considered old in the u.s it just depends on the definition actually we did an entire episode on that um called uh uh, what makes something historic? So, if you want a bit more familiarity with that kind of subject, go check that video out. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and Tyler, you're absolutely right. There are going to be there are going to be academics who are dismissive of this book because it's like, well, what are historians doing, going and dispelling popular myths and all that? That's not what historians do. They're supposed to be creating history, not dealing with bad history. And it's like, well, you can't exactly avoid this stuff. You can't just be off in your little ivory tower and pretend that the world doesn't pass you by. It is unfortunate, but uh, common that you see a lot of the, uh, this kind of dismissiveness in in academia, and uh, it makes the uh, history profession increasingly irrelevant. Um, and by the way, guys, I will not be uh, addressing other channels, so stop asking me questions about other channels. Uh, uh, that's not what I do. Um, American, uh, do, 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 um, what is the, uh, this is a, uh, rather interesting question because it depends on how you mean harm, right? Um, you know, 
how is it harming people currently or how it has harmed people in the past? Um, Because, for instance, I would say that the frontier myth has been the most harmful myth in American history. But currently, not even as harmful as like the lost cause and lost cause is already on its way out, you know. Um, you know, but in terms of overall history, there is one central myth that the history profession pushed and uh, and basically it was the foundation of the history profession. And we're now all collectively kind of fighting it. It's it's the national myth that a uh, that a nation can have a character. Um, and by defining a national character, you can marginalize people by saying that they do not fit that character. Hence why we use the term marginalization. It's a marginalized from the national character. It is quite literally the most harmful myth, period. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, but that's, that's a kind of like meta history, you know, <laughs> uh, nationalist history is, is basically gone. Um, but, uh, it still is like foundational to, uh, how it's taught in school and that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's like the most harmful myth, but, uh, it's, it's a little too meta. Um, <clears throat> The uh, and you're not wrong, uh, secret, secret Asian Dan. <laughs> um, you're not wrong. Like the the uh, but the one we can definitely say has been the most harmful is the one that's caused the most harm already. You know. <laughs> um. Oh, hey, John of History is here. Oh, and uh, thank you, uh, Nix Highlander. <laughs> uh, Nix Highlander, I think. <laughs> That's hard to to figure out. Um, but what was uh, Drone of History saying? Um, by the way, Drone of History uh, just put out a video that has uh, yours truly playing. Uh, hold on, I should full screen my uh, video. Has uh that guy who's just sitting over there minding his own business <laughs> king richard the first um but playing the historical character king richard the first um and uh so what does uh what what does tim say uh what in American history were you so sure was a myth until you dug deeper and found it to be true? Uh, oh, it's a good question, but I, I don't actually know. Um, but, uh, Merc here, Merc with a mouth. <laughs> uh, ha oh, it's a Deadpool reference, of course. Uh, <laughs> the uh, has kind of the reverse of Drawn of History's question, which I can answer. Just recently, I've kind of learned how right wing uh, Silicon Valley is. Like, I've been doing a bunch of research into Silicon Valley as a, uh, as like, um, as a, uh, for the California history series. And like, you know, there's this general myth that like, you know, you got a bunch of, you know, liberal, just hippie types running, uh, running all these tech companies and that and it's quite the opposite, quite the opposite. They are uh, actually quite right, white, right, right wing. Um, you know, there's a reason why the Hoover Institute is at Stanford. You know, and that's that's one of those things where it was like surprising to learn because I definitely believe that myth that that 
almost a conspiracy theory that like, you know, all these hippies are trying to, you know, control the internet and all that kind of stuff. You hear that kind of thing all the time. And, uh, it's, it's exactly the opposite. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's, uh, that's th at least a recent example of a myth I believed and, uh, and learned, nope, wrong. <laughs> and, uh, Let's see here, what does tr uh, tracking the core of stuff and more lull? <laughs> Should we mytho uh, mythologize the word race out of the American mythologize the word out? Um, as it was a social construct to oppress black people, not just black people, but uh, anyone who was colorized, uh, racialized as a uh, color rather than white. Um, and I'm actually working on an episode about uh, the about the uh, um, about the uh, how race is a social construct, how it became socially constructed. Uh, in fact, here let me turn off the banner real quick, and uh, you guys can actually see um, once I get it open. Do, 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 and boom. There we go. Um, you can see the bibliography for this. You can also see that I have been... Um, oh, I actually did get that done. I can green that out. But the uh, you can see this is the outline I've done so far. And then here's where I am, what I have to write from there on. Um, so yeah, I'm actually working on this specific topic, uh, but, um, oh, let me get it a little bigger. I do have a pretty substantial, um, bibliography for this thing. Um, and you can see the, uh, yeah, it's actually, yeah, it's, uh, it's a page and a half of bibliography. So yeah, there's a, I did a lot of research on this. I'm finally getting around to writing the actual script and everything. That's uh, kind of what I've been working on for the last uh, couple days. Um, <clears throat> although I've been dealing with some, um, you know, academic stuff as well. But um, yeah, I, I am working on a whole thing about how uh race is a social construct i don't know what you mean by mythologize it out uh but like for instance one of these books is called like the myth of race or something like that where is it ah here it is the myth of race by uh wald Ro robert wald sussman um the uh you know <laughs> the troubling persistence of an unscientific idea um, published published by Harvard. So, you know, um, and uh, also that book was interesting because I believe Robert Sussman is uh, is a uh, biologist or something like that. So, you know, he's writing this as a, uh, you know, as a scientist and talking about how this dangerous unscientific idea um but yeah there's a whole bunch in here to to dig into and to to understand for that um but uh now that because that was a good question but we have gotten a little bit off track here um also, there were a lot of comments that I completely missed while answering that. So, let's go back to Myth America. So, I already explained what a edited volume is. So, let's let's talk about um, how they formulate this whole thing. And I have a banner, there we go, that just has the names of each of the chapters. You'll notice one of them is even Founding Myths, so we'll get to it. Let's talk about the order of these of uh, these uh, chapters. Because remember what we did last time is fully dissect a book. It's a little bit more difficult to dissect an edited volume because 
you know, each chapter is its own singular thing. While they do have an introduction, um, that introduction is basically just talking about the urgency of, of busting some of these myths. Um, and you'll also notice that, like, some of these are titled as, like, the thing that they're, the myth that they're busting, but other ones are, like, the thing that people are, like, myths surrounding things because obviously the border itself is not a myth it's that's a like it's there but um you know the uh you know or the new deal it's obviously the new deal is not a myth but uh there are myths surrounding it although actually i would argue that chapter in particular is about the new deal chapter is less about myth busting and more about misconceptions. So the difference between a myth and a misconception, um, as defined by uh, by uh, Kevin Cruz and Julian uh, Zelizer, um, who I man, what I'm forgetting the name of the book that they wrote. I believe they already wrote a book together, and it was about like the. Uh, Hold on, let me uh, find it real quick. Uh, no, okay, I gotta wait for my bibliography to load, and my bibliography takes like a full minute for it to load. I mean, like seriously, it it's just massive. <laughs> um, but we'll just have this sitting in the corner, and it'll yeah, you see that little number going up. That number has to hit, go up to I believe a uh, hundred and eighty pages. <laughs> Um, anyways, uh, Cruz and Zelizer um, define myth pretty much the same as as everyone does, which is to uh, which is to um, say that like myths are lies we tell ourselves to inform our identity. Um, you know that that's the key thing that makes something a myth is. Um, that it informs identity. Now, I would actually argue that it doesn't have to be a falsehood. We can tell ourselves truths uh, and form myths. Um, you know, you'll also notice that they are very, very anti-Trump and are really pissed off about January 6th um, in this book. Um, in fact, there's an entire chapter about... Uh, insurrections in here that pretty closely follows my insurrection video interestingly enough and it's by kathleen bellew bellew is a prominent historian of american violence um anyways the uh um the uh the main thing that they're arguing here is that uh these myths are informing the public uh with incorrect assumptions that um, form an identity that is opposed to the truth and harms people, right? Now, I wouldn't necessarily say that all myths are harmful. I I actually am um, kind of opposed to their definition of a myth here. But I will openly admit that I use the term myth pretty similarly when I'm talking about it in like the lost cause myth and things like that, where it's like an actively harmful myth. But you will also notice that I talk about the, uh, the, uh, wow, I'm, how am I, it's a simple name, John Brown. There we go. <laughs> like I talk about the John Brown myth in, um, the episode, uh, the Good Lord Bird. Yeah, that's it. My review of Good, L War Good Lord Bird. Um, and I specifically state in that that I actually think that we should keep that myth around. That we shouldn't, uh, you know, it is a sign of maturity to recognize that your myth, that you believe in incorrect things. But you can still believe in the myth even when it's, you know, not real. For instance, like, yeah. John Brown never killed a single slave owner, but he did, uh, his men actually killed the slave. So, you know, there's there is that problem of truth versus versus the myth. But 
the myth is useful. It forms a good identity. Um, uh, so, like, even though it's partially based on falsehood, it can still be good. Um, there are such things as good myths. Um, and very... I don't know what that means, Venara. Um, I don't, I don't know what the uh, secondhand lines is. Oh, by the way, let's uh check and make sure. Oh no, it hasn't loaded yet. I'm just gonna make this its own um, its own window, and that'll keep it loading. Problem with having such a big um bibliography is uh, whoops is that um, you have to uh, you have to like wait for it to load. <laughs> uh, so but that's the basic premise of this book. Now each chapter is its own myth and written by a different author. So you do get very different voices and some of them even have differing definitions of myth from Cruz and Zelizer's, uh, uh definition here. But the main thing is that they're positioning this book as a way to fight disinformation. For instance, you guys might remember a long time ago I did a reaction to PragerU. Uh, guess what one of these chapters specifically call out as like one of the main sources of disinformation on the internet? Um, where is it? Insurrection, Great Race, Black. Flash. There it is. Right there. Prager you. <laughs> oh, and this one's written by Cruz. <laughs> um, wait, I just remembered. Isn't it Age of Fracture that uh, Kevin Cruz wrote? Out? Is this fully... Oh, this takes forever to load. Um... But, uh, yeah, so <laughs> they specifically call out um, that as a problem. Um, oh, by the way, Thorium, uh, the reason why I uh, the reason why I can find stuff in this bibliography is that it's sectioned off by topic. You can see, um, I can't really go full full size because they'll screw up the the loading time but um yeah you can see right here that like there's a whole table of contents right here and we can go down the side and see that there's a bunch of topics you'll notice that uh a lot of it focuses on american violence and the southwest it's because that's my specialty <laughs> i've read the most books on it uh you know, so there's like just a ton of uh, of stuff here, um, and when I when it says Western historiography, I'm talking about the U.S. West, not like you know Western Europe or something. No, I mean like Western uh, the U.S. West. That's why you see Bancroft right here at the top and Billington, Brown, um, Getzman. Um, where's Limerick? There's Limerick. I haven't talked to Patty in a while. Um, anyways, um, it has now loaded. So let's find the book that uh, that uh, Cruz and Zellinger, Zellizer wrote. Um, I should probably turn off that banner. Uh... Am I misspelling Cruz? Hold on a second. Oh, I uh, misspelled it. There we go. There's one. That's the book we're looking at right now. That's the book we're looking at right now. Why is that in here twice? Fault lines. Okay, they wrote fault lines together. That's right. Um, fault lines is an interesting book. Uh, I have 
it uh i have it physically what whoa, 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 what just happened second world war and civil rights movement oh yeah he writes about um yeah anyways uh let's just find the cover real quick you'll guys see um so this is essentially a history of uh of the U.S. since uh, since the uh, since Nixon resigned, um, and they basically theme it around the rise of neoliberalism and how that has kind of driven American history ever since um, ever since the uh, rise of neoliberalism. Um, so yeah, they. Uh, I recognize it better with this cover because um, that's the cover I have. I don't think I have it over here. Yeah, it's in, it's in my bedroom. Um, <clears throat> I have the physical book on that one. But uh, interesting book. I, I liked it. A lot of my class did not. Uh, a lot of them found it to be kind of a just point by point, little, little being said kind of thing. Um which you know that's a that's a bit uh, you know if it's that dry then it makes it difficult to read you know um, but I'll tell you what th this uh, this book is not dry you are not gonna look at this go, go to the title page thank you you're not gonna look at this book and think that um, you know there are a couple of um of chapters that are dry and we'll get to that in just a second but the uh the main thing is they're they're busting fairly persistent myths that a lot of people don't even realize so now that we've talked about like the theming of the book and everything let's jump into the chapters themselves so you'll notice that the uh there there we go You'll notice that the uh, <clears throat> and thorium, uh, uh, it depends on your definition in liberal, because there's been neolibs um, there ever since. I, I wouldn't really call Ford a, a neoliberal, but Carter was a neoliberal. He was basically the first neolib in the White House. Um, but uh, basically, every every president has been a neolib. Um, although I don't know if you could call the current one a neolib or Trump. We might be in we might be in a new party system now. But uh, you know, I'll leave that up to people who actually study it. <laughs> um, and uh, thanks for saying that. Uh, Charlene, um, but uh, the uh, so back on target. The uh, <laughs> each chapter is roughly assembled uh, chronologically. So uh, the first one is kind of a much larger one. Uh, much more meta about like American exceptionalism in general, but then the rest of them are roughly chronological. So you start off with the founding, um, you know, and then talk about like the whole myth of the vanishing Indians, uh, how like the, the whole idea of like ch chain migration um, in under Erica Lee, Erica Lee wrote a fantastic book on, uh, on Chinese immigration. Um, then this talks about like the uh, where we get the term America first and its long history, because a lot of people like to turn it into like, oh well, the Klan uses it. No, I mean, yeah, they do, but like that doesn't make it specific to uh, to xenophobia, nor the 1940 through 41 uh, America First Committee. 
actually the term America first goes way back. That's actually what this chapter is about, is about the persistent history of the usage of that term since the uh, 1820s. Yes, 20s, 1820s. Um, it was started off as basically an anti-Masonic slogan. <laughs> uh, then the next chapter is arguing about like how even by standard definitions of empire, the U.S. is in fact an empire. Um, the border one, I don't remember what the border one is about, but I have highlighted... Ah, here it is. It says that uh, it is a myth that the border is only a place of danger, dysfunction, and Ill illegality. It is even more so a place of creativity, community, cooperation, connection, uh, and connection. This is as true today as it has been for almost two centuries. So uh, basically the, uh, you know, uh, the border is, uh, there's a lot of uh, cultural intermixing at the border um, and shouldn't be portrayed as opposing sides rather than a meeting place. Uh, back to the table of, Contents? Where's the table of contents? Am I going the right direction? There we go. So then the next chapter is about American socialism. Interestingly enough, uh, the word socialism, well, its French version was coined by uh, Saint Simon. Uh, the English version of socialism, the, the English term socialism might have been coined, no joke, because of a speech in front of Congress. And Congress applauded uh, Owen, the guy who was making the speech, um, for having this view of, uh, of um, you know, a socialist United States. So the idea that, like, socialism is opposed to Americanism forgets a lot of history of, of American socialism. Um, then we have uh, we have the magic of the marketplace. So this is talking about how like a lot of people refuse to uh, hear in fact here I'm pretty sure I just have the thesis statement highlighted. Here we go. Um, Americans resist uh, resolutions to impose regulation on the marketplace, clinging to the notion that the best way to solve our problems is through the workings of the marketplace. They suggest that the private sector can handle these matters and that any government action is likely to fail, perhaps making things worse than they already are. Moving forward, it says... And you can see it down here. The truth is that American governments have always been involved in managing and at times even directing the economic life of the nation. And economic freedom does not guarantee political freedom. The myth of the magic of the marketplace was invented to defend the prerogative of business leaders <clears throat> while denying many prerogatives of workers and consumers. It centered a, uh, on a false claim about historic significance of free enterprise. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a heck of a freaking myth, right? Like a lot of the, uh, I'll bet you there's people in the comment uh, in the, uh, in uh, who's watching this right now who are uh, rather peeved by that. Uh why does it say starred? What does that mean? Oh, okay. Uh, the, it's not, it's actually not the neoliberal myth. It's kind of just the liberal myth. <laughs> like, he's talking about, you know, the 1930s, you know, not the, uh, basically fighting against the New Deal as in like conservative the, the conservative coalition that was basically led by Hoover um and yes adam smith absolutely hated landlords most most uh uh economists 
especially uh, 18th and 19th century economists, even early 20th century economists, despised landlords. I mean, David Ricardo probably was the most vicious about it, far more vicious than Marx. Um, you know, David Ricardo was basically saying, you know, let's go full Mao and just execute them all. Um, so, yeah. And so, yeah, there's this is uh, this chapter uh, covers how the U.S. has a long history of regulating the marketplace and being directly involved and in uh, in directing it. And this whole myth of free enterprise being, you know, foundational to American prosperity is uh, a bit wrong <laughs> I mean, he doesn't say that like it has uh, that is that free enterprise has been you know completely useless but he is saying that the idea that that american prosperity is founded on free enterprise is false um let's get back to the contents Okay, so the next one is the New Deal. Now, this chapter is uh, is one I would argue is not actually a, a myth. He's just annoyed with like a standard uh, a standard misinterpretation that a lot of uh, Republicans like to spout off when talking about a new New Deal, um, or specifically the Green New Deal, if you guys remember all that. Um, but you'll see that it, even in this chapter, he specifically addresses it addresses the uh, yeah right here. Specifically says like you may wonder if claiming that the New Deal qualifies as a myth, you know, unlike other myths in this collection, blah blah blah. Um, you know that I also would argue it's not really a myth because it doesn't inform identity. It's just a misconception. But the main misconception is defeating, and I'm pretty sure... Did I not highlight anything here? I'm pretty sure I highlighted something here. Um, doo -doo -doo. Annotations, that's the one I need. Uh, let's see here. Go down to here. Okay. Ah, it's right at the end of the chapter. His thesis statement is at the end of the chapter. Bad writing. <laughs> you shouldn't be. Your thesis statement should come out clearly at the beginning of your of your work. Um. Anyways, we he says we cannot necessarily be based on this information that. We can yeah, we cannot necessarily say based on this information that the New Deal promoted this recovery, but we can say that if to use Grassley's uh Grassley's the person he's arguing against, um, phrase the New Deal dampered economic growth, it did not dampen it sufficiently um to uh prevent an extraordinarily rapid rate of recovery from the Great Depression. And then he goes on to say um, moreover, there are reasons to believe that the New Deal's policies did encourage recovery. So, yeah, the the argument here is basically, uh, you know, we can't say for sure if the New Deal worked, but we can, but we can say for sure it did not not work. <laughs> All right. Now to go back to the table of contents. Yeah. All right, and now we're to Confederate monuments. This is basically the thing. Uh, this is basically going uh, talking about what I've talked about in the uh, in the lost cause myth thing. This is basically refuting the lost cause. Um, it's also saying, you know, like. Monu a lot of Confederate monuments are indeed monuments to white supremacy. Um, 
so the next one is the Southern Strategy one. This is uh, saying that, yes, indeed, the parties did flip. And to quote Cruz himself, <laughs> that's almost exactly what I said. <laughs> there was indeed a long-term transformation in the two parties, first at the national level and then subsequently at the state and local levels, a process that stands at the core of 20th century political history. Over several decades, Democrats abandoned their role as the party of slavery, segregation, and white supremacy to champion civil rights. In response, Republicans retreated from their original racial liberalism and courted white resentment. So, yeah. Basically, my party switch episode. <laughs> um. And, you know, it's interesting that he phrases this as, as going against specifically PragerU, <laughs> uh, which I believe is like their second most popular video is, is, the, is the one with uh, Carol Swain. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, the, uh, it's quite a problem that uh, how often you see this one. All right, so uh, chapter 13 is about the good protest. So this is basically talking about how, um, and realize CRM stands for the Civil Rights Movement. Um, basically this idea that like, um, well actually details, uh, this one's actually kind of, quite a comprehensive batch of things that um, he, she is reputing, I forgot who wrote this. She is, I don't know who Glenda Gilmore is. Um, but uh, <clears throat> the uh, <clears throat> all right, so uh, by the way, Tom, we talked a little bit about this. Um, there's a mm, it's important to um, give a more comprehensive definition of this. Uh, let me get rid of the banner real quick while I'm actually responding to comments. Uh, <clears throat> so the uh, the difference between myth and legend is mostly, uh, I, I don't know, <laughs> but I can tell you the difference between a myth and a conspiracy theory. A conspiracy theory is a uh, is a lie that um, that uh, that theorizes that there is some sort of conspiracy, um, you know, afoot by positing um, positing a story through uh, through an absence of evidence rather than with evidence. So it's an it's an argument from silence essentially. Um, it's the well, the FBI didn't say that they didn't do this, so they must have done that. Um, you know, a myth is a story we tell ourselves to inform our identity. Now, under uh, Zeliz or Cruz and Zelizer's uh, definition here, um, they their definition is that it has to be a lie, um, a story that is false. Um and knowingly false, by the way. It's not, I mean, for them, it, it has to be like purposely uh, false, as in a lie. Because um, you could tell falsehoods and just be wrong. <laughs> you know, you don't, you could, like, there's a difference between lying and being wrong, you know? Um, and there's a difference between. Um, myth and conspiracy theory. Now, I don't really, I can't really tell you the difference between myth and legend. Um, consult a dictionary on that one. <laughs> but like, the difference between myth and conspiracy theory is uh, one is being used as like an argument from silence, as in like there's an absence of evidence, um, or it doesn't actually have to be a, a real absence of evidence. It's a perceived lack of evidence, and then theorizing a uh, conspiracy to to explain that absence um whereas a myth is a story we tell ourselves to uh to inform our identity um 
although Cruz and Zelizer would specifically say that it has to be false or a lie. Um, and still alive. Uh, let's see here. Um, hi, Cypher. Hello. Uh, huge fan of your channel, especially as a history major myself. Nice. Um, I was wondering if you have ever seen the Pacific series and if you might do a based on true story on it. No, I, I'm, I'm not going to... Um, like, I've gotten a lot of requests to do Band of Brothers as well. Um, but uh, no, I, also, uh, I have serious issues with the with the author of Band of Brothers. Uh, and I don't know. It, I know Pacific was made by the same company. Um, I have seen the series, um, but I it, it's also really difficult to do episodes on entire TV shows. Uh, that's a lot of notes. That's a lot of time. Realize it takes me about three times as long to uh, watch something and take notes and everything. Like, actually, I think I have one of my notepads right here. And I could show you. Ooh, I almost spilled my beer. That would have been bad. Um, yeah, so like, you can see, I actually take notes. Um, whoop, 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 there we go. I take notes, will you focus? There we go. And like you have the timestamp here, you have like what's going on, and then you also have like quality things like see, you know, minus, plus, all those things. Um, I also have some notations that are like, well, yeah, <laughs> I think you guys can guess what that notation is. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, there, I have special notations for, like, you know, good-looking scene. Um, yeah, yeah, like, uh, this is, like, means, like, there's something cinematic about this. Um, <clears throat> so, and, like, this is, like, a po potential thumbnail, um, that little square thing. Uh, and then... Let's see here. Yeah, all right. So, yo, know, this is for the Hamilton one, and you can see there's music there. Um, what what is the heart supposed to mean? Oh, that's referring. There's like this whole subplot of like, uh, of like. Uh, three-way between Hamilton and all that, so I started recording that. Um, that is referring to, like, mentions of slavery. Uh, you know, or uh, this is kind of, like, my standard thing to talk about, like, um, any kind of uh, intersectionality um, you know, within the uh, work. So, like, you know, I have to keep track of all that it takes a lot of time just to watch and do that um and then on top of all of that it's a tv show so it's like even longer you know the nice thing about like for instance when i did the uh, good lord bird was that as i started watching it i was like i need i need to do something about this but i also didn't actually like take notes or anything like it was just after having watched all of it, it was just like this is so good. I need to talk about it. <laughs> I did that the same thing with like the sun, you know. And it's it's one of those things like, do I need to talk about it? I, I don't really feel the need to talk about the Pacific. I also don't really like talking so much about World War Two. It's World War Two stuff is just it's too much. It's too uh, there's way too many things. Um. Let's see here. Just trying to catch up on all the comments. Do 
do do do. All right, not much. Oh, and we have another super. Um, <clears throat> can you hold up your drink, exaggerate drunkenness, and scream out Wilson? <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> Just, why not? <laughs> Wilson! <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I don't know how to exaggerate drunkenness, but... Um... <laughs> um Alright, so, let's get back to the book. Um, so, let me put on the little banner thing. Here's the little, you know, all the chapters. Um, but, uh, do, 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 show this. Oh, no. No, 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 no. There we go. <laughs> uh, there we go. <clears throat> so, uh, the chapter we're on is about the good protest, talking about like how we mythologize the civil rights movement. And this one actually has quite a list of things that they, uh, that we mythologize. Uh, so first it chronicles a long civil rights movement from the 1890s to the 1950s that ultimately led to the classical phase of the movement. Classical, classical phase being 1954 to 68. Um, well, no, more like 1954 to 65. Basically, el ending with Selma is, you know, from Montgomery to Selma rather than Montgomery to Memphis. Um, but uh, sometimes people include Memphis in the classical phase, uh, you know, and uh, ev all the uh, Black Power stuff and that. Uh, <clears throat> The, this longer um, look demonstrates that winning the civil rights uh, winning civil rights was much more difficult than most Americans believe. That African Americans had always fought for equality. Second, it dispels the notion that most Americans supported the protests. Leaders such as Martin Luther King Jr., who have been canonized in the past thirty five years, were vilified then and. Th Third, it proves that the classical phase protests were and had always been about issues other than simply abolishing segregation. Police brutality, economic equality, voting rights, and cultural symbols have always been on the civil rights agenda. Fourth, it sees the yeah, it sees the classical phase as incomplete with issues that remain on the national agenda. Reshaping the national myth of the good protest uncovers a more useful past in the face of growing anti-protest sentiment. Um, so, quite an interesting chapter um, because, like, it it really does. Uh, like, there is this weird kind of like the you know, the civil rights movement was good, but everything outside of it isn't, and, like, somehow the civil rights movement was purely about um, ending segregation, which, no. Um, so, like, yeah, there's a whole bunch there um, that it busts. Then let's go on to the next chapter, which is White Backlash. Oh, yeah, this one's an interesting one, because this one is basically arguing... Uh, what seems like a pretty nitpicky kind of myth, but uh, it actually has pretty massive connotations. Uh, so um, there's this kind of standard thing that, like, you know, with the rise of black militancy, there was a white backlash to, like, black power and that kind of thing. Um, whereas it's actually kind of the opposite way around. So more accurately understood as the that white backlash is more un accurately understood as persistent not episodic backlashes 
are the continuous long-term and ongoing attempt by white conservative reactionaries to stand in the way of black people's demands for equality. Indeed, it was this pattern of white op opposition that made African-American campaigns for equality necessary in the first place. So, um, you know, it's, it's actually the, this whole idea of uh, backlash politics being an answer to black extremism is misleading. And, you know, it seems like a, a bit of a nitpick, but then when you realize that it's talking about white backlash being in continuity with white supremacy, you start seeing that backlash politics today can't be described as separate from white supremacist movements that they are attempting to separate themselves from. That's a heck of a uh, that's a heck of a myth, right? Um, and Jaden, yeah, uh, KKK started in 1866. Uh, the first like militantly uh, militant black movement would probably be the new Negro movement after World War I. Um, at least I guess you could accurately describe that as pretty militant. Um, and yeah, uh, World War I ended in 1918, <laughs> a bit afterwards. And also the second KKK had already come into ex existence in 1915. Um, had already grown to massive popularity, especially because of the war. So, yeah, literally, like the first, um, the first uh, m militant black movement um, was uh, the New Negro movement, and that was uh, 1918, and KKK formed in 1915. So, yeah. <laughs> um. Why didn't the civil rights movement achieve major victories earlier? Man, that is a heavy question. Uh, but basically, white supremacy. <laughs> now, there were groups like the KKK. <laughs> um. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, throwback to an uh, earlier thing about uh, the Pacific right there. Let me uh, full screen this. Uh, so this is an interesting thing on the uh, on the uh, on um, so Stephen Ambrose didn't fabricate sources or lie. The th thing that Stephen uh, uh, um, his Eisenhower bio. I think you're thinking of Doris Kearns Goodwin there, Matt, Bam. Um, Doris Kearns Goodwin uh, wrote the one uh, wrote about uh, Eisenhower and um, JFK and LBJ. She actually worked in the LBJ administration, um, but she is like Ambrose is a well-known plagiarist. And unfortunately, still gets a lot of uh, gets called out or called by like CNN and that to talk about history when she's basically persona non grata in the professional oil history scene. Like she and Stephen Ambrose would have been too if he hadn't died before his uh, his plagiarism uh, was discovered. My uh, father, for instance, who is also a historian. Um, refuses to watch Band of Brothers because of the plagiarism in it. Um, like it, it plagiarism is really the, the greatest sin a, uh, a historian can make. Um, you, uh, it's one of the things that will make you basically persona non grata like that. Um, I don't know if you guys could hear that, that, <laughs> um, so it, it's actually a pretty big deal. Uh, and I might at some point make an episode about that. There's a great book uh, called, let me put it up. I have it digitally. Um, oh, Past Imperfect. Um, and I really like it because uh, 
because um, do, 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 do. hold on. There we go. Um, so past imperfect here is actually uh, covers these specific controversies. Uh, it um, talks about how like the uh, history profession was like founded on nationalism and we've been kind of fighting against that ever since to the recent scandals of Stephen Ambrose, Michael Belisellius, uh, Stephen Ellis? I don't remember the name of it, who, who, what that Ellis person is. Uh, do, 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 Joseph Ellis. I. Oh, this is a case of fabrication. Okay, I don't remember what Joseph Ellis did, but uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, and uh, you can see right there. See, they're uh, both listed as plagiarists uh, in this book. So, yeah would be an interesting thing to do. This is a, I, I really like this book. Maybe I can do the, a book talk about this book um, at some point, because this is, you know, this is talking about like how the history profession is not perfect. You know, there's, and, um, you know, we have, a, a, there is a history of very popular people. I mean, look at Bella Celius saying Bella Celius had a, massive fall from grace even though the entire uh history profession kind of came or fell in around him um for a little bit as he was being attacked by the nra and then as soon as it found out that he couldn't back up one of his tables it was like you're gone <laughs> like it's it, it, the history profession can be an interesting thing and it would be an interesting episode to talk about that yeah um do, do, do. Um, hold on, let me get back to here and uh, let me c try to catch up with all this stuff. Uh, and uh, okay, so Ellis lied about his Vietnam service. Did he write a book about Vietnam or something? Or maybe I should just look up Joseph Ellis. Yeah. Um, oh, he's one of the founder chic people. Okay. So, not really related to his historical scholarship, I guess, but, you know, yeah. He probably did benefit from his use of stolen valor. Um, and that is pretty despicable. Um, but, uh, yeah, not exactly uh, the issues we're dealing with here. Um, doo -doo -doo. Hold on, let me close some of these tabs. And let's get back to the book itself. Um, let me pull up the thing. I'll just keep that there, that one, so you can keep on being reminded what the name of the book is. Uh, and let's move on to the next chapter, which is about the Great Society. So, hold on. There we go. Um, Joshua Zeitz. I recognize that name. What? What is that name? Oh, Flapper. I've read Flapper. Um, I haven't read any of the other ones. Um, but anyways. Uh, <clears throat> let's see here. Let's go find... Okay, here it is. Um, basically, he's this is kind of the same argument as uh as that new deal chapter it's basically saying like look this actually worked and um we still benefit from a lot of uh lbj's great society programs um no matter how much uh, conservatives complain about it um 
interesting question there, Dinmus, and I believe that is literally the next chapter. Um, okay, well, it's not exactly uh, about... Um, so it's... Okay, I remember what this chapter is. This chapter is basically arguing that a lot of... Uh, yeah, here you can see the... Uh, thesis statement. Contrary to the fear-mongering rhetoric of politicians, history reveals that police violence very often inflamed community violence, not the other way around. So, it's less like did the civil rights movement get hurt by the riots that are associated with it, and more, um, were the riots caused by the civil rights movement, or by police? And this uh, this um, this chapter is arguing that it's law enforcement. Now, um, I will point out that this, this chapter does have one significant error and it, it's conflating different types of law enforcement. A, a very common thing, especially from like leftists, they love to call everything the police, be it sheriff, marshal, whatever. Um, you know, bailiffs are police to them. Um, but like, these are all different things, you know, to them, security guards are police. <laughs> uh, and this, this chapter absolutely does that a lot. Um, you know, for instance, the police that attacked, um, that attacked people in, uh, Selma on that bridge, those are, those are sheriffs and deputies, uh, not police, you know. Those are different kind of law enforcement entails different different forms of enforcement. Duh. Um, but uh, <laughs> sports referees, police. <laughs> According to some, <laughs> they are policing the 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 uh you know football field. <laughs> Yeah, so basically, you know, did violence and riots hurt the civil rights movement? It, it, this chapter is arguing that that's the wrong question. Um, now, I will say that several civil rights leaders had different interpretations of that question. Um, so, to get off of that, um, so there were... For instance, Martin Luther King was very clear that he thought that uh, riots were detrimental to the unit to to the uh, civil rights movement. Um, whereas you have a lot of Black Power folks who are basically saying, you know, not only is that the wrong question, um, but like it's uh, like some of them would argue that it was helpful. Um, you know, that like the persistent threat of riots um, made people, uh, made politicians more favorable to uh, civil rights legislation. I would argue against that interpretation. History seems to say quite the opposite, that uh, that um, the uh, that mob, that mob violence tends to uh encourage um encourage uh you know backlash but as we also saw in the previous chapter backlash is actually in continuity with white supremacy not um you know its own separate thing um so yeah it, it's actually a pretty comp that's a pretty complicated question and sometimes it's a mis and under certain interpretations it's also a misleading question But uh, depending on your interpretation, it could be any number of answers. Uh, so let's go on to the next chapter, uh, which is, I believe, Kathleen Bellew's. Yeah. So Bellew is uh, uh, a historian of American violence. She wrote a great book called... Um, Bring the war home. Do I have it here? Or do I have it? Mm, 
I think I have it in my overall Google Books. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can find it in my Google Books. Uh, uh, show all. Yeah, there it is. <clears throat> so uh, she wrote this book. Um, Bring the War Home, White Power Movement in Parallel Military America. Uh, so it's basically talking about the white power movement after Vietnam, how they used like the 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 uh, you know veterans' anger over losing that war um, as a way of, uh, as a recruiting tool, and she charts the growth of the uh, white power movement from there and its use of the of the, um, you know basically uh, the mistreatment of veterans. Um, as a, a continued mistreatment and continued fear mongering around it um, as a means of recruitment and bolstering the movement all the way. And the, the uh, book ends at Oklahoma city um, basically arguing that like that phase of the uh, white supremacy in, um, in the U S that the, of like paramilitary, um, violence, you know, uh, is, uh, is, uh, kind of what informs, uh, white supremacy today, you know, especially things like the alt-right and, and, uh, other kinds of far-right folks, um, and how this specific kind of militarism, you know, like QAnon, uh, led, you know, and that she basically furthers that argument in this chapter, saying that like QAnon and all the other stuff about like uh, you know uh, saying that like the uh, these kinds of conspiracy theories are inherently violent and written uh, 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 written large through this kind of white supremacist violence. Um. So yeah, she's. Uh, because there was this persistent thing right after January 6th that, oh, and here it is. Although in this case it is understandable, emotional reaction meant to decry anti-democratic violence, the notion that January 6th is not who we are is one manifestation of what has become a regularly deployed Republican Party and right-wing media strategy to deny the workings of overt and violent racist activism, even when those actions threaten American citizens and democracy itself. Um, so you can tell, Bellew's, uh, Bellew has a way with words, doesn't she? <laughs> and I, I really like this chapter because she, she basically, like, Honestly, if you want to read this book, like uh, specifically, like if you get to this chapter, it would it would be a great companion to go straight read this book, the uh, Bring the War Home, um, and uh, whoops, what did I do? How did I go all the way? How did I go all the way back around? <laughs> uh, you know, start off with Bring the War Home, and then. Just as you finish that, go straight to this, um, this book, and this chapter. It's kind of like a bridge between those. Although this chapter mostly doesn't really talk about like two thousands violence, um, she does at least bring it to Columbine. Um, so uh, yeah, that, fascinating thing. Uh, and I see we have a super here. Hold on. Um, Something else I was curious about was how you teach about Reagan and Clinton eras of U.S. history, or are they barely mentioned in your curriculum? Uh, for my second half of American history, uh, there is an entire week devoted to uh, the Reagan era. Um, but Clinton, no, not not much. Uh, there's like a slide. Uh, in fact, I can show that. Hold on a second. I can literally just pull up my uh, lecture notes. Do do do. Hold on. Course materials. Second half. Let's 
so this is just my uh, my actual course materials um, to answer the thing. Um, I do have an entire week on that uh, on Reagan, but then um, this is all the attention Clinton gets. <laughs> uh, you know, um, and funny thing about this thing i go straight from this to talk about the growth of the internet and no joke uh let me get rid of this but for you guys can't really see it but i intentionally rickroll my students <laughs> oh yeah by the way that that militia movement thing right there that that bullet point is completely based off of uh of bring the war home so yeah um so let's uh, get back to on topic. Uh, let's see here. Oop, let's get rid of that. And we don't need that. Um, do do do. So we just got done with chapter 17. Now chapter 18. Family values. It's This would actually be better phrased as family values versus feminism. So there's this persistent myth that uh, feminists like hate family values, that family values is opposed to, uh, you know, if you believe in family values, you are opposed to feminism. And that's just... Uh, patently false, right? Like the the feminist movements uh, have, for the most part, actually been in favor of uh, you know uh, families much more so than conservatives. You know, they believe in equality, and for some reason, family values doesn't mean equality anymore. Um, and um, so the the thesis of this one is feminists have. And notice the uh, italicizations. Fem feminists have never been dead set on destroying the family before, during, or after Schlafly's heyday. Schlafly being the uh, league antagonist to the Equal Rights Amendment during the uh, 1970s and early 80s. Um, and she continued to be this far right figure. In fact, I think she actually like, didn't she die just, um, just after, uh, Trump got elected or something like that. And she like endorsed him or something. Oh no, she died during the campaign, but she, okay. Yeah. Um, but she actually, I believe endorsed Trump. Yeah, okay. Here we go. Here's an article specifically that, you know, Phyllis Schlafly made the case for Donald Trump. Blah, blah, blah. blah. Yeah, right? So even into her uh, into her, her last year, she was supporting far-right candidates. Um, the uh, don't need to go any further into that. And so... Um, you know, this, this chapter is making that argument. Next, we have the Reagan Revolution. And this is by uh, Zelizer. Um, and this one's about uh, <clears throat> basically saying that the Reagan Revolution wasn't as revolution as important as people make it out to be. So the argument that there was a Reagan Revolution was born out of an explicit political bleh, explicit political strategy. The administration wanted to cement the impression that Reagan's victory had been a mandate for conservatism. Claims about a Reagan revolution exaggerated the strength of conservatism and, equally important, the demise of liberalism. So, yeah, it's a... It's a... And Sebastian Lee, no, it's it's about the bring the war home. I've already talked about it. It's about Vietnam. Um, 
And uh, I don't know what a Foucault's boomerang is. The idea that eventually the colonial violence done by colonizer to the colonized is applied in the metropole itself against any and all resistance. Is that something Foucault wrote? What is that from? I. It must be from like one of his articles or something, because I I've read almost all of his books. Uh, I don't remember him talking about that. <laughs> um, but in fact, uh, I plan to eventually make an episode about Foucault. Um, funny thing is that episode will actually be more mo- mostly about Nietzsche. Um, from Robert Evans, the author and podcaster. I don't know who that is. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've, I've never heard that claim. That sounds more like, uh, a Malcolm X thing. You know, the, uh, birds coming home to roost comment he made about JFK. Um, But uh, yeah, no, that's it's not really the same thing um, at all. It's not some, you know, colonial violence coming back and revisited upon the U.S. It's like, uh, no, that's more about uh, uh, white supremacy using veterans as like to to recruit extremists. You see this on the left too. It's just not as strong. It's but. There is absolutely an attempt to use veteran resentment to recruit. Um, so, uh, God, you like it there, Adrian. Uh, so, uh, back to this thing, the, the, this this chapter on uh, the Reagan Revolution. So, basically, there has been this kind of idea that, like. Um, and this is one that I'm guilty of, like straight up. In fact, we were just showing lectures and I have the Reagan one right here. Um, so like, I'm totally guilty of this myth. (laughs) I basically argue that it's true in this. I need to rewrite this, this, uh, this lecture, but like, yeah, I, (laughs) big hair and consumers. <laughs> uh, I have fun with my lectures, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, and, and this this chapter also argues that, like, um, that, like, Reagan's foreign policy wasn't as, you know, revolutionary at, uh, either. Um, where is it? Yeah, here we go. The the idea that the Reagan Revolution extended to the realm of foreign policy as well, following a decade of Democratic Party had withdrawn from supporting a robust national security state as a result of Vietnam. The argument goes, Americans grew t- tired. Uh, so basically, Viet- oh, well, it says it right there, Vietnam Syndrome. Um, you know, that he was the answer to Vietnam Syndrome. And I kind of do that myself here. <laughs> So this is actually one of the myths that like I'm guilty of, you know, and I teach it, right? Uh and uh and of course I have a whole thing on the Iran Contra and fall of the USSR. Um although I will say I do not teach it like Reagan is the cause of the fall of the USSR. It's just as it was falling apart was a part of the Reagan era. Um, and Reagan obviously wasn't president in uh, 1989, except for a month. But, uh, you know, George H.W. Bush was. So, you know, it, his vice president. So, yeah, the like, some of these things I'm guilty of. <laughs> But also, this is basically saying that people overemphasize the impact of the Reagan Revolution. Um, in fact, you can see uh, another 
right wing freaking dimwit who I've uh, argued quite vociferously against in my own videos. Um, you know who he, uh, who uh, Zelizer is specifically arguing against in this chapter. All right, so. Uh, before we get to the next chapter, let's uh, let me answer this super real quick um, from Deacon Fatal. Uh, as a historian, where do you see us at a as a whole in the uh, twenty to fifty year in the next twenty to fifty years? Are you asking like uh, and oh, I should. Uh, I should go thank Mr. Terry. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen him for a while. Um, did he go to Edgy Hangout, or was it at, uh, or was it at VidCon I last saw him? I think it was at VidCon I last saw him. La not this year, but last year. Um, but uh, I, I avoid, um, you know, prediction. I'm a historian, not a uh, not a fortune teller. Um, you know, it. This is a thing that comes up a lot that people try to uh, try to predict the future by what's happened in the past, um, and I just know better than to do that from a long history of doing that. There's a joke on the Discord server, for instance, that. Uh, that um you know an ongoing joke of like i'm not allowed to <laughs> make predictions because the few times that i have i've been so dreadfully wrong <laughs> and that's why i avoid it um the uh but um <clears throat> yeah so moving on from that chapter and also, thank you, uh, Deacon Fatal, for the uh, for the super. Uh, to I yeah, he's it, my dad. <laughs> um, but uh, anyways, the last chapter is, and I purposely very lightly touched the first chapters because we're going to go we're going to loop back to them and just uh, to um explain them further because they touch on the episode that i just recently did so let's uh let's finish this one out with the whole idea of voter fraud right you know this is the most recent myth that they're covering and so um just to quote the thesis statement although it's a pretty long one if i remember correctly yeah um, this epic electoral battle referring to, uh, all the lawsuits and everything about trying to overturn the election and eventually January 6th itself. So this electoral ba battle in the 21st century was not an anomaly. It built on a long sordid history of partisan allegations of voter fraud attacks. In fact, that targeted racial and ethnic minorities as well as naturalized citizens from immigrant communities. Um, because, the because the Reconstruction Era 15th Amendment bans using um, race to disenfranchise Americans, the operatives and politicians camouflage their discriminatory intent behind the charge of voter fraud to create the illusion that their primary concern was election integrity and democracy. And by deploying the pretense of defending a significant state interest, uh, protecting the sanctity of free and fair elections, rather than the more distasteful power grab based on pandering to racism and xenophobia, lawmakers legitimized a number of policies to disenfranchise millions of American citizens. And once again, I will point out, this came out in 2023. I, I've only read this like a few, a few months ago. Uh, basically, once I finished my dissertation and had time to read other things. Um, the, so, like, for instance, when I've talked about this in my, uh, in my uh, Party Switch video, and um, I also talked about 
this in the systemic racism video. Both videos, I touch on this specific thing um, and how like there is actually a history to using these claims to disenfranchise people. And that like even Jim Crow is based on being colorblind. Um, so like this whole um, this whole call for uh, for uh, voter disenfranchisement is is pretty dark once you actually understand the history of it. Um, and so that's what this chapter is about. Um, I'll point out a number of these other myths I've actually touched on at, long before the book even came out. So I'm doing my part. <laughs> uh, so, wow, I it's been what almost two hours and i have i have yet to uh, yet to finish my first beer hmm. not drinking fast enough i guess uh so let's see here we were uh, i wanted to loop back and specifically talk about the american exceptionalism one uh fa and the founding myths one um so the american exceptionalism one uh so, firstly, interesting thing. Do you know where the term American exceptionalism comes from? It's like, is Joseph Stalin? Like, no joke. Joseph Stalin created the term, uh, the the term. Um, so this chapter is interesting, though. So what it does is it talks about, like, okay, what do we mean by American exceptionalism? How is it used? Um, but then the second half is talking about how um, the idea of American exceptionalism has been this, like, political football for a while, especially created by Newt Gingrich. Um, so this one doesn't exactly have a thesis statement. And it's another reason why I wanted to loop back to it. Because um, I, I hit on pieces of this, right? Um, so, like, I talk about how, um, it, you know, the whole idea of American exceptionalism doesn't really make a lot of analytical sense, right? Um, it's, it's useful more to talk about people believe that the U.S. is exceptional rather than, like, actual exception. Um, so uh, this guy is, talks about how, like, from the moment Europeans arrived on American shores, they created, they crafted stories about their special destiny. Although, here's an interesting little mistake that I've made before, um, and this points out, um, the term is not shining city on a hill, it's we shall be as a city upon a hill. Ronald Reagan rephrased that as "shining city upon a hill" from his uh, from his uh, 1980 uh, day before election speech thing. Um, so yeah, that <laughs> minor misconception, but like even I've done that, and that's from Reagan. <laughs> uh, you know, then says the insistent attention on. Uh, to Puritans of New England tends to eclipse the fact that the inhabitants of all the British colonies and their successor states imagined themselves as Romans at least as often as they saw themselves as Israelites. The stories uh, dot, 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 the stories that nations tell about themselves also change over time, and America has had a bewildering and contradictory plethora of them. So this one's literally talking about American character, that that like foundational myth of the entire history profession. This one's talking about that. And so that's like, you might remember in the 10 founding myths that I just recently did. Uh, I talk about the whole idea of American nationhood and uh, the Turner thesis. Uh, that's actually in here um, somewhere, but, uh, but only briefly. Um, I'm just, uh, I love to harp on Turner because I'm a Western historian, so, you know, it's, it's just kind of what I do. <laughs> uh, 
but like ah uh, Oh, um, anyways, the uh, so this first part of the chapter is about like how Americans have seen themselves as like an exceptional, a different character, that national character myth, right? Um, basically, the foundational myth to nationalism, um, but like how it's been used in different, in varying ways. But then it shifts to talking about how, like, Gingrich took the I, the, the uh, uh, Stalinist idea of American exceptionalism, basically trying to explain why, like, the U.S. doesn't have uh, the, uh, the Communist Party of the United States of America, CPUSA, uh, which was actually, like, funded by uh, the uh, – partially funded by um, – uh, foreign agents by soviet agents um and uh you know stalin wanted to know why it wasn't working right um and he basically uh, one of his uh it, it comes up earlier here where is the stuff about stalinism blah blah blah, blah. i don't think i highlighted it no this is just Creation character myths, blah blah blah. Okay, well, uh, either way, it it's uh, not actually Stalin who came up with the term. It was one of his like uh, aides, but uh, it had the term American exceptionalism had kind of had um, partially died out until Newt Gingrich uh, revived it. Uh, and so uh, explaining that, this author says, uh, Gingrich's passion for American exceptionalism was not, of course, motivated by abstract intellectual curiosity. With his unerring instinct for the political jugular, which, yeah, he was quite the political operator, he recognized that the term could provide a highly effective political weapon against the Democratic Party and the left. Um, so basically, you know how, uh, even, uh, even people like Obama and Hillary Clinton and, um, Joe Biden, they all, they all have to like, kind of make nods that, uh, America is exceptional. It's the greatest country on earth, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you know, this is, uh, weaponizing, uh, that kind of rhetoric to basically say that if you aren't you know say uh, that if you disbelieve in american exceptionalism then you're anti-american right which when you think about it it's like couldn't you argue that uh, you know it's a literal stalinist idea <laughs> couldn't you argue that american exceptionalism is anti-american um but the the rest of this chapter delves into how this weaponization of this concept um, has been used as a way to stifle any kind of criticism of like the military industrial complex or uh, or like um, foreign wars or uh, you know anybody uh, or a way to uh, you know remove funding from universities because well they're anti-american because they have professors who are you know Commies or whatever, um, you know that kind of stuff, right? It it serves a political purpose and is weaponized in a way that uh, kind of forces even people who would typically be against it to continue to utilize the myth. It's fascinating. Um, that's why I wanted to cover it in a little bit more depth here. Um, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> you like the idea now? <laughs> uh, but the... <laughs> Anyways, let's move on to the chapter that is literally called Founding Myths. And you see, this one's interesting, and the reason why I wanted to end on this one um, is that it has a whole list, like a whole list of different ones. And so it's a, oh, why won't you allow me to, ah, literally won't me, allow me to make the uh, text bigger. Anyways, so I think it's five myths, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so five myths that it specifically debunks. And you'll notice that I actually don't really cover most of these in my Founding Myths video. Um, although I skirt around some of them. Um, but uh, none of them are in disagreement with me. But I will point out that I read this book after I had already, like, basically made this episode, uh, the last episode. This just happened to be a good uh, addition to it. Um, so I didn't base the episode on this book. I just happened to uh, use it to improve the episode in various ways. Anyways, the five myths he busts here, uh, or I don't, I don't actually know if that's a male or female. Name. <laughs> Is Aquila a dude or a woman? <laughs> I should look that up. It's a dude. Okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> Anyways, the uh the the five myths he busts are uh myth number 1. James Madison was the father of the Constitution. No, that would be George Washington and paternity matters. Cuz yeah, actually George Washington was the uh president of the uh, uh of the Constituent Assembly uh, formed in 1787 to create the constitution. So it wasn't actually James Madison. It was, uh, mostly directed by, uh, Washington. Um, myth number two, the key federalist essay is Madison's federalist number 10. No, almost no one read that Madison essay in the 1780s, uh, or indeed in the ensuing century, the key federalist essays, um, in the ratification era were John Jay's and Alexander Hamilton's number two through eight, explaining Washingtonian and geostrategic essence of the Federalists' plan. Um, so a lot of people, including myself, had to read Federalist number 10 um, to uh, in high school. Like that was, uh, that was a basic, uh, it was a, basic requirement in high school. Um, and yeah, I don't remember what it was about <laughs> off the top of my head, but, uh, it turns out Federalist number 10 wasn't as important as everybody makes it out to be. Um, you can also see these are kind of eh, unimportant myths. So myth number three, the framers believed in republics, but disdained democracy. I hit this one directly in, in my episode. Uh, no, despite certain language that appeared in Madison's Federalist number 10, these two words were more synonymous than op oppositional in general uh, um, 1780s discourse. Regardless of the label we now choose to use, the framers believed in and part participated uh, and practiced popular self-government. Um, so yeah, this, this is, uh, uh, I directly, uh, did that. And I actually used some of the, uh, some of the way that he, uh, attacks that, that myth in my video. Um, because yeah, like the whole idea that like, republics uh, you, you can either be a republic or a democracy makes no bloody sense you can absolutely be a democratic republic duh and that's exactly what we are um anyone who says otherwise is either doesn't understand english wants to curtail rights or wants to score stupid points for freaking uh the republican government that it's it, it's nonsense um 
So uh, myth number four, the Constitution was indeterminate on and perhaps even supportive of secession. And he says, ridiculous. <laughs> Washington's geostrategic constitution categorically repudiated unilateral state secession. So this is a lost causer thing that you'll often hear that like uh, that uh, that they had a right to secede. And no, they didn't. No, they didn't. Not in any way, shape, or form. Uh, the Supreme Court did eventually actually rule on that in 1867, obviously after the war, but no, it, it's absolutely ridiculous to think that, like, there was a right to secede built in the Constitution. Absolutely not. Um, and finally, myth number five, the Constitution was designed by the rich and for the rich. Um, and this is one of those ones where it's like, eh, really? The document was just what it said it was, a text ordained by the people, not by the property. Um, and you'll notice that he says beard is bunk here. Uh, so this is one of those ones where it's like, it depends on how you understand the emphasis on um, for the rich. Um, and he's referring to uh, Charles A. Beard. Is it Charles A. Beard? I think it's Charles A. Beard. Yeah, okay. So he's referring to uh, Charles Beard here. Uh, can we get a picture of his books? Because he has one very... Yeah, okay. The, the Economic Interpretation of the Constitution of the United States. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the book that he's referring to right here as bunk. Um, now, I, I wouldn't call it bunk, but it is... Uh, basically is saying that this is old hat that it's uh you know overemphasizing the role of trying to protect property rather than uh the people and their rights um so yeah uh will you stop highlighting thank you so those are all the chapters of this thing. So let me put on the banner that has the chapters. There we go. Um, so. Um, now that we've gone through each and every chapter. Um, what kind of questions do you guys have of this uh, overall book? Uh, you'll notice scrolling uh down below is the actual uh you know chapters um and we can dig into them if you would like um is used a lot by people who think the constitution isn't worth reading yeah i, I see a lot of people uh, i see a lot of people doing this specifically where they're trying to be like you know the constitution is bs it's made by rich people to protect rich people and it's like that's no, not really um is there any section you feel could have been better uh yeah uh especially the two that are on um on the new deal so eric Rochway. Uh, I don't know how to say that. Your, your uh, comment is blocking it. The New Deal one, that one, eh. Also, I'm I, look. I'm a cultural historian, so I'm going to be. Uh, I don't really like reading economic history, so I also just didn't like reading it. Um. And uh. And uh, the Great Society one by Joshua Zeitz. Um, both of those were pretty lame. You gotta say, those were, those were both uh, could have been a lot better, especially if they had any like actual storytelling. Like, you gotta tell a story. Um, um,
Actually, not all of them, Adrian. Uh, not all of the not all the framers of the Constitution were uh, were rich. That's false. Um, <laughs> economics. Ew. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I don't like, I don't like reading economic historians. They're just boring. <laughs> you gotta have a little bit of spice in there, you know. <laughs> How is the United States an empire section? Uh, so, uh, the weird thing on this, on it is basically it's a lot of the the dictionary says this kind of thing and. I used to be a fan of just kind of being like, look, the, the dictionary says this. How can you argue against that? But like, English is a fluid thing. You can move definitions around and like have varying senses in that. Um, you know, it's important to be able to define your concepts and everything and define it within a, uh, you know, within what is standardized usage. But it gets kind of tedious when you're just like constantly referring back to a dictionary like yeah it, it, that's more of a that's that's less of like saying that the chapter is wrong or anything that's more saying that like it's just a little rote you know um how do you define <laughs> let's look up the definition of rote so that we can talk about rote definitions <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know why I find that so funny. <laughs> I've only had one beer. <laughs> and I haven't even finished it. I'm about to finish it, though. Um, Define rote. I believe it's spelled like that. Yeah. Ah, mechanical or habitual repetition of something to be learned. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Wrote def uh, just go straight to the dictionary <laughs> to complain about dictionary usage. <laughs> uh, I don't think I need to be sharing the screen anymore. I'll go back to full screen it. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, the the empire section is pretty rote. Um, Uh, by the way, uh, I believe Tyler can assign, uh, moderator, uh, things there, since I know you have changed your account. Uh, <clears throat> uh, for it, well, let's just look up the, uh, then let's look up the actual, uh, uh, Framers of the Constitution. Oh, we're not going to have, uh, like, who buy wealth? There you go. Here's an article. Wait, is this the same person? No, this is not the same person. Do, do, do. Wait, why am I why am I looking up articles? I could just go straight to the book. Uh and I just realized I am not sharing my screen. Um do, do, do. I could go straight here. Yeah, okay, this is going to take forever to... You can read the chapter, but there are there are indeed framers who were poor. Um, anyways, 
Let's see here. <laughs> How many history books are titled Alternate Economics? None. <laughs> Therefore, economic history is boring. <laughs> um, uh, so, no, there isn't any. And you are referring specifically to a historian who is rather disgraced. We actually mentioned him earlier, Michael Belisellius. Uh Best not tread those waters. <laughs> the profession has learned its lesson. Um, do, 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 do. Trying to catch up. Where was Thomas Paine in all this? If you're talking about during the uh, uh, framing of the Constitution, he was back in Britain. He moved back in uh, like, like 1786, 1785, somewhere around there. Do, do, do. All right, I th think there isn't any other questions there. Um, yeah, Payton. Pain died a uh, penniless man. Pen, yeah, penniless man. Um, and partially because he went after George Washington when he moved back to the U.S. after the, uh, after um, the, uh, I forgot the person who followed Jefferson as a uh, magistrate to, uh, to France, but um, uh, whoever that was got him out of, prison because he was actually on the chopping block for the guillotine um and he came back but then he it's thomas Paine. he's always got to be complaining about something right and so he started going after uh george washington who was president at the time and um and yeah like nobody really forgave him for that yeah they, they really hated him for that <laughs> And so, like, nobody even attended his funeral. Like, literally, it was, like, a slave he freed and, uh, and like, a, you know, a caretaker or something like that were the only people at his funeral. You know, this person who was a founding father and, like, more responsible, uh, the person with who was most responsible for planting the idea of independence and that hereditary monarchy was wrong um died penniless and completely ostracized um <laughs> give me facts history man um i couldn't give you a number cuz it also depends on how you define uh uh well two things how you define founding fathers and how you define going back to britain so for instance Payne obviously went directly back moved back continued to be there until he started writing pro french revolution stuff and then ended up going to france and then uh france started to think about you know threw him in jail and started thinking about guillotining him and then he came back to the us um but um there were other founding fathers like uh, John Adams, who uh, lived in uh, Britain for quite some time because he was the uh, U.S. ambassador, or magistrate is the term back then. But um, uh, 
minister, not magistrate. Dang it. Yeah. The U S minister to, uh, to uh, Great Britain. So does that count as moving back? Um, you know, probably not. It's not like he had an embassy or anything. So it's not like today where we consider embassies to be foreign soil within a country. Um, but still, you know, you, you get the point. Um, there were other founding fathers. Who, like there, there were, there was one of the signers of the declaration, if I remember correctly, like one of the actual signers uh, ended up moving back to Britain. So, like, yeah, it it's complicated. Um, so, why did Payne criticize Washington? Mostly over the Jay Treaty. If uh, so, the Jay Treaty was uh, what, like, seventeen ninety four, seventeen ninety five, something like that. Let's look that up. Uh, J Treaty. Great. So it was 1794 and 1795. <laughs> I was taking a wild guess, and somehow I managed to guess at both the correct dates. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> and it actually went into effect in 1796, but... <laughs> Signed in 1794, ratified in 1795. Uh, the uh, the Jay Treaty was deeply unpopular. Let's put it this way. A mob broke all of Washington's windows in Philadelphia because of that. Um, like, not Philadelphia, New York, right? No, it was Philadelphia at that point. The capital moved around a bit before uh, settling in D.C. Um, in 1801. Um, so, like, it would be in Princeton at points, it would be in freaking New York, it was all over the place. Um, but, like, a mob literally attacked what was essentially the White House before the White House because of this treaty. Um, so it was deeply unpopular. In fact, uh, I've... I've heard some historians argue that uh, that Washington would not have been considered a good president if it weren't for his farewell speech, which I will point out he didn't really write. He uh, 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 Alexander Hamilton wrote most of the farewell speech. So um, the uh, and it's weird because Hamilton actually was a terrible writer. Like he just like, I shouldn't say terrible writer. Cause he could write a lot. <laughs> I mean, like he wrote like, like two thirds of the, uh, of the, uh, of the federalist papers, which all came out over the course of like, what, three months, something like that, <laughs> three or four months. So like <laughs> dude could write, but he couldn't write well. That was the problem. He was a he was a pedant. He was a freaking uh, well. Let's put it this way: he was the first person. Uh, he was the first uh, secretary of the treasury. So, as in like economics, and we just uh, we were making fun of uh, e economists and economic historians' inability to write earlier. So, same goes for Alexander Hamilton. Yet somehow, the uh, the farewell speech is incredible. Um, and it basically, in one fell swoop, uh, by the way, most it wasn't perceived as a like spoken speech for most people. They just read it in in newspapers, you know. Um, but uh, that that farewell speech is kind of what rejuvenated Washington's uh, uh, legacy. Otherwise, he probably would have been remembered as a pretty bad president actually um so yeah it's one of those things where you know it, leaving people with a good impression matters a lot <clears throat> so uh tyler asked a question is there any historian who worked on the book that you loathe who wish wasn't involved. Uh, I'm going to have to look at the uh, authors. 
I mean, I wouldn't say I loathe anyone, um, but uh, I think for the most part, I, I'm just flicking through them. For the most part, it's just I don't recognize most of the names because they're in topics that I don't know. Um, who is... I kind of recognize Joshua Zeitz, but I don't know why. Oh, that's the flapper guy. Okay. Yeah, no. I mean, some of them I even recognize from books that I've used before. So, for instance, there is, uh, you know, Kath Carol Anderson. I used her book about... Uh, I used her book about, um, like, here, we could probably find it just in my, uh... there you go. Yeah, one person, one vote. I used her book about voter suppression in the, uh, uh, the systemic racism episode. Um, Zelizer, we've already been over, um. Don't know. I obviously think Bellew is a good historian. Um, Zaitz, Glitman. I feel like I should know that name. Yeah, I don't recognize that at all. Um, Carol Cox, I recognize. Erica Lee, I've, I re like her work. Uh, a lot of these I just don't recognize, so I couldn't tell you. Pro probably no one. I wonder who is this? I, I should recognize that name, I think. No, oh, no, I've never read any of those. Okay. But realize, I, I mean... Most of the time, you don't study history by, like, studying the historians themselves, you know? Like, they're just whoever wrote the book. They just happen to have the name on it. Like, you're reading the book, you know? Not them. Um, <laughs> so there's a so there's a uh a uh, di uh uh not discord uh twitch thing where you pay uh, where you spend points to um to uh get a particular action and everything and one of them is uh to uh show the cap the only problem is king is not in the room right now he got annoyed with all my talking um so uh i have to actually go and grab him now because that is part of the uh part of the thing so i will be back in just a second <laughs> oh actually i'll get up I'll grab King, and I will also grab a uh, the the book from uh, the uh, the editors of this book, which would be perfect. So I will first put on this little uh, uh, well, I'll be back thing, and I will be back.
Oh no, I didn't loop the video. <laughs> ah. <laughs> King's like, I don't want to be here. I just woke him up by, uh, he was sleeping on the bed. Um, <laughs> but here's King. <laughs> yeah. Wow. No, 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 go there. Go there. There you go. <laughs> There's King. Um. Yeah, he he was sleeping on my bed, so um, he's like, I don't want to be here. But I also had the opportunity to go and get the book. See, this is the book I was talking about. The that um, fault lines. I actually took a class that was called Twentieth Century Capitalism. It was mostly about the rise of neoliberalism. Um, but this was uh, one of the books that we read for that class. Uh. Let me see, because this is more like a textbook than a than like a monograph or something. So it's not it doesn't have like a thesis per se, but I think it does kind of have like a main argument. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, on the uh, introduction thing, they argue, uh, Zelzer and oh, I just realized it is showing the wrong banner. Um, the, uh, but in this book, the same authors as the book that we, the same editors, because realize they edited the book and were not only authors of certain chapters, but in this book, they argue, um, these three basic fault lines of division, fault lines, um, the economic, racial, and political lines Obama outlined, plus a fourth line on gender and sexuality, had always been part of the national experience. A, uh, skipping forward, a robust federal government, a thriving middle class uh, economy, and a powerful union movement had each, in its own significant way, ameliorated these sources of division. Moving forward... Rather than seek to find new sources of agreement, the nation reconstituted itself in the 1970s and the decades that followed in ways that augmented and institutionalized these lines of division. Um, moving forward, abandoning the search for common ground in political and economic life, they increasingly valued competition and even conflict. From the 1970s on, the United States would seem less and less united with each passing decade. So, yeah, I actually use this book uh, pretty heavily in my uh, in my neoliberalism episode. Because um, this is one of the few books about neoliberalism that actually brings it to the present, um, which is rare. Um and I think I even mentioned the book in my dissertation. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think I do. But. <laughs> so. Uh, right. Conflict and. Oh, you're talking about Kevin Cruz. I think I know which book you're talking about. See here. Oh yeah, he wrote the White Flight book. Uh, Fog of War. I've used that one before too. I've actually used a bunch of his books. Um. If I'm.
uh, if when I, uh, so Tyler, when I'm talking about fog of war, this is referring to a book, uh, this book in particular, um, which I believe I have digitally. Hold on, let me look it up. Uh, the, I th think I have it either digitally there or is it here? Ah, okay. Yeah, I have it here. <laughs> so as you can see, um, I actually have used these pretty extensively. Will it? This is the Fog of War book I'm referring to. Um, I've used it in an episode. I don't remember what, but... Uh, Oh, no, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. I used it in the um, Veterans History episode. And this is also another edited volume. So this is one of those ones where it has uh, um, a whole bunch of different uh, um, you know, uh, a, a bunch of different topics and everything. Anyways. Um, so now that we've talked about all that, I want to reiterate the thing that we started this video with, which was the, um, Trova trips thing. Let me put that at the bottom. So, um, before I go and everything, I wanted to reiterate that I will be hosting a group trip to uh, Germany and Austria um, in June of next year. You can go to the link down below to uh, see that. And, um, you know, a bunch of, acti you know, the tour guides, the, uh, the uh, nine meals and the travel in between these different cities, because we'll, we'll be going from Munich to Salzburg to Vienna. Um, hitting a bunch of places like a uh, few castles and a uh, palace, but also uh, uh, preparing for a uh, review of The Sound of Music. So it'd be nice to go to actual like Sound of Music themed places, uh, which will be a whole day. Um, you know, and my function on this will be basically be as host. So I'll gather everybody around, set, give my little spiel about the place, and then we'll um, go to a uh, go to a uh, uh, to you know a castle or a new city or something like that. Remember Munich, Salzburg, Vienna, um, and um. The uh, there will also be, you know, of course, once we're done with that tour, it's kind of up to us where to go in the evening. Um, and oh, yeah, I, I don't know if I said that the this includes like the hotel costs, the the travel costs and the guide costs. So it's it's all one package. Um, there's limited space, so you have to go there. Um, and it seems like it'll just be a lot of fun. Um, you know, there's, uh, the, and yes and no, uh, Didium, it's, uh, it, it, Didium, Didium, I've actually kind of talked about that in my police brutality video. Anyways, the, uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, so if anybody has any questions about that, ask. Um, I'm happy to answer it. it. Seems like a heck of a lot of fun. We'll uh, you know, be traveling around from Germany to Austria, and uh, I'll be hosting it, um, but also learning alongside you guys. Um, you know, there's got there's got to be some beer for sure. Um, uh. Like, for instance, I know the Munich one. And if you go down here, you can actually see the, uh, you can see, uh, you know, what hotel is planned, um, when the breakfast, like what the breakfast would be, how long the guided tours will be, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
you know, which day is each of these things. Um, then, um, uh, the, uh, <laughs> although I will say, there's no way you're going around the entire, uh, entirety of New Schwanstein, uh, in an hour. No way. <laughs> um, so some of the, the time guesses are, are guesses. You can see the little, you know, thing right there. Um, anyways, uh, so my thing would be as host, but I will still be learning alongside you guys. I love learning about, uh, like, castles are one of those things that are just, I don't know, it's like, I, I'm kind of a little kid about that, you know? <laughs> I've, I used to watch, uh, I used to uh, go out of my way to find documentaries on, like, castle sieges. I don't know why, it was always a thing for me. Um, one of those odd curiosities. Um, <laughs> will there be singing? <laughs> Uh, I hope not. <laughs> Are we going to storm any beer halls? Yeah, well, we're in Munich. Might as well <laughs> gather gather the boys, put on the brown shirts. Let's go. <laughs> um. So, uh. The link is in the description. There's also the link in the uh, in the thing. If nobody has any further questions, I guess it's time to call it a night. Uh, so to reiterate what we've talked about with uh, Myth America, um, you will remember that it is an edited volume. It covers a lot of different topics, but you can also see there's a general theme. It's this uh, growing amount of uh, of uh, basically mythology fueling our politics i would argue that it's not really growing it's just always been there but the hatred of these uh myths is growing that that is true um and they're trying to fight that with this book um so it's a fun book uh there's a lot to talk about there and i hope you guys got a lot out of it and don't forget about the trove trip thing uh you know I want to do this. It seems like fun. But got to get got to get enough bookings in order to uh, in order to uh, do that. So be sure to uh, if you if you want to, be sure to book it. Um, and to go along with the theme of it, as uh, as Lady Tyler here is saying, she says uh, she's referring to uh, to uh, uh, you know the sound of music. So so long, farewell. Auf Wiedersehen. Goodbye. <laughs> it's been fun, guys. Um, I'll see y'all in the next one.